Now we're recording. So there are a few phases of, uh, of planning for pregnancy. Nobody plans for pregnancy. But it sure would be nice if we followed these plans. Preconception counseling is, I think I want to get pregnant next year. One of the questions on your test said, I'm, I want to take birth control for a year and then get pregnant next year. And the answer was, wonderful, take folic acid. Okay, that's preconception counseling. Eat right, exercise, get your habits right, eat properly, and prepare for that healthy pregnancy. Did your book cover, I don't remember, did your book cover why we have folic acid? Why we need it during pregnancy? Mm -hmm. Always or for a certain time before you get pregnant? 90 days. Folic acid is only useful for the 90 days before you conceive and the first 28 days of the pregnancy. That four month period is the only time there's any value to it at all. But unfortunately, 50% of pregnancies in America are unplanned. So since nobody knows when they're going to get pregnant, they don't know when that 90-day window is. So we say every woman of childbearing age, which is all of you, should be taking sub uh, folic acid supplements every day with your prenatal vitamins. Unless, of course, you don't have a uterus or something. You're pretty okay. You're probably not going to get pregnant. Okay? But all women of childbearing age who are fertile should be taking, pre uh, should be taking folic acid supplementation, whether they want to get pregnant or not. Okay, and then periconception, of course, that's around. That's all the stuff I just talked about with my new OB education. But interconception is what do you think? The I don't want pregnancies. Pregnancy. Exactly, between pregnancies, right? From one pregnancy to the other, and it's uh, you focus in that about uh, about getting back to fighting weight, about getting back to, to, to normal to, to where you were before, plus ten pounds, and then uh, um, and, and preparing for the next pregnancy. Okay, it's a time to talk about like, you know, we really want 24 months from one child to the next to let your body recover. So a good 12 to 16 months before getting pregnant again would be a wonderful idea. Um, especially if you've had a C-section, we want at least 12 months, but 24 months is better. Uh, that sort of thing. So it's the, it's the when are you going to get pregnant again in between pregnancies. And whenever I talk about birth control, my first question is when do you want to have your next baby? Okay, and they go, well, I'm due in May. No, no, the next baby. When are you gonna have your next baby? This one, we, it's already, I can't do anything about it. It's coming in May, fine. What about the one after that? Okay, um, you know, well, this is the only one I'm ever gonna have. Okay, then my birth control education needs to be on long-term, very effective forms of contraception. Oh, I wanna get pregnant right away. Okay, then my birth control method needs to be short-term, less effective, it doesn't really matter, right? Or I don't know, well, that's a great time to start thinking about when you're gonna get pregnant again. Now's the time to think about those things so that we can plan the next pregnancy so you can be better, better prepared for it, so your body can be better prepared for it, so you have better outcomes. So that's interconception counseling. And then um, preconception counseling for the next baby, okay? Healthy body, we wanna talk about there, we already talked about this, exposure to illnesses, exposure to STIs, lifestyle choices. If someone is a prostitute, it's a wonderful time to say, well, let's make sure that you're not gonna accidentally get pregnant, you know? Or someone is on methadone because of a heroin addiction. Well, we gotta really talk about what happens if you get pregnant. Is it a good idea, is it not a good idea? You know, um, those kind of things. And then I talked about doing a physical exam and genetic testing. The interesting thing about physical exams when you're pregnant is they take like five minutes. They're really easy. Because if you're healthy enough to get pregnant, you probably have a pretty normal body. And so I don't have to do my thyroid exam. You know how they teach you to do it? Like a swallow, displace, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, you don't have to do that. I just grab my throat and swallow, perfect, moving on. You know, I listen to lungs in four places, top and bottom, eh, good enough, okay? Because they're pregnant, not only, you know, they. If you have COPD, you're infertile, period. It's just not going to happen, right? I'm not listening for, for, for pneumonia. I just want to make sure all of her lungs work, okay? And uh, it's going to change anyway over the next six months, so who really cares? We're okay. So the physical exam is a little bit uh, abbreviated, although the pelvic exam is a little bit more detailed. Um, but, it's, it's, but you need some form of physical exam to early pregnancy. Making sure we got a healthy mind, healthy mom, healthy family, healthy everything, really useful. Talking about their, you know, their, their, their relationship changes with their family. How many of you have met mean pregnant women? Oh, they're out there. Mean, mean pregnant women. 
<laughs> What's that? I said, that's why I don't want to do this. Okay. But there are some mean pregnant women out there, and they say mean things, they do mean things. They can even become abusive in pregnancy. And, uh, you know, it's hard to be the spouse of a mean pregnant woman, okay? It really is. Because you've got to be so sweet and nice and supportive, and you're like a little mouse, terrified of the elephant in the room. Like, it's like living with a 500-pound gorilla. And so those relationship changes can cause some real problems. Before we had our first baby, my wife bought me a book, and I still have it today. It's What to Expect When Your Wife's Expanding. Okay? And it's based, on the, it's based on the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. And it's written along the same, the same, uh, the same model, you know. And every, every chapter starts with the, uh, the symptoms that she may be experiencing in this month. And it always talks about highs and lows, emotional instability, crying for no reason, anger, depression, swelling, and the same list every month. It's pretty funny. Um, but it's written for dads, and it kind of gives them a little, a little insight into the changes that are going to happen during pregnancy. Moms and dads need this. Dads need to know what to expect. Moms need to know what to expect, okay? Readiness for fatherhood, um, you know, it, it's important to understand, you know, that just like, uh, it takes two to tango. Two people got this woman pregnant, two people are going to take care of this woman during her pregnancy, two people are going to take care of this baby afterward. And so well, while we spend a lot of the time talking about moms, we also need to spend time talking about dad. Who is dad? Where is dad? Why is dad? What's he doing? What's he thinking? What's his plan? Okay? It needs to happen. Preferably in dad speak. Okay? Um, I, uh, I love to teach nurses how to speak boy, okay? because I'm boy lingual, and so I speak boy pretty well. Um, when you speak to women, especially around pregnancy, you can use emotions, you can use uh, love, you can use pink, pastel, butterflies, and unicorns. And that's okay, okay? Most women will get that. And that's why almost everything in pregnancy is written in that, in that language. When you speak to men, though, it's earth tones and jokes and analogies, okay? It's that the breastfeeding is like a car with fuel consumption and exhaust and performance and maintenance, right? You know, that kind of thing. So you have to speak a little differently when you speak to men. You have to speak like men, okay? Just like when I talk to mom, I speak very much like a woman because I have to get my point across. When you speak to men, you have to speak like a man to get your point across. Otherwise, you're wasting your time, okay? If I sit and talk to mom about analytical things and talk about cars and sports, she's not going to get it, right? And I'm wasting my time. Same thing, okay? Nutrition awakening, we talked about this. Water. Always we want more water, okay? In pregnancy, uh, uh, when you become dehydrated, it irritates the uterus, just like if you're exercising and you're not drinking water, it irritates the muscles. Pregnant women contract more when they're, when they're dehydrated, okay? And so dehydration causes an awful lot of problems. And so if it's not a blood sugar problem, it's a dehydration problem. And so every time a woman's like, oh, I'm contracting, I got weak and dizzy, I feel spain, uh, sit down, eat a peanut butter and crackers, and drink a gallon of water, and call me back. Okay, well, that's the problem. That's the answer for almost every minor problem in pregnancy. <laughs> Rest, put your feet up, drink a gallon of water, eat something sweet, and call me back. Okay, and an hour from now, it's all better. And you're like, ta-da, fixed it. Why? Because we need protein, we need calories, and we need rest. Okay? And then uh, your book talks a lot about iron and folic acid supplementation. Um, there was a little bit in the physiologic, uh, um, in the, the, patholo the physiologic changes in pregnancy that talked about that physiologic anemia, about how more plasma volume makes the, uh, the hemoglobin, um, makes it appear that there's less hemoglobin for use. And so they're, even though their iron stores remain grossly unchanged, because everything has expanded so much, they have to enhance their iron for supplementation. So we always want pregnant women to take a prenatal vitamin that has iron and folic acid. None of the other things in the prenatal vitamins, by the way, do anything at all. Um, weight gain, we talked about weight gain. Eating disorders, pica. Who, is, what, who can tell me what pica is? Eating, eating yes. weird things, exactly. <laughs> eating non-food items. Uh, the most common is ice, clay, uh, cornstarch, chalk. chalk. Yeah. Anyone here experienced pica while they were pregnant? The number one is ice. Well, Whatever. I, I didn't want to eat uh -huh. anything, but I wanted to touch baby powder. And I hate like dryness and stuff, mm -hmm. so it was weird to me, but I didn't want to eat it. I just wanted to play with it. Mm -hmm. My mom had she was pregnant with me. There you go. Yeah. It happens. It's very, very common. And what I generally tell people is, well, okay, so you want to eat cornstarch. 
fine. Is cornstarch edible? Of course it's edible. Okay, the big problem with pica is that they don't lose calories in favor of these non-food items. Okay, so I usually would make a deal on, oh, you like cornstarch? Cornstarch, by all means, it's not poisonous. You can have cornstarch. Let's go with one teaspoon a day. And they'll, they'll buy it. Okay, I'll take one teaspoon a day. He said I could have it, yeah. One teaspoon of cornstarch isn't gonna hurt anybody. And they can take it, oh, I feel better. Or sometimes they take a whole teaspoon. And then they, they feel bad, they come I cheated, I like having like two teaspoons a day. Like, <laughs> well, okay, we can't get you back down to one. <laughs> but it's okay. Now when they're talking about eating dirt, soil out of the ground in their garden, not a good idea. Because what's in the soil? The big one. What's the one that kills babies? It's in the soil. Toxoplasmosis. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big one. Okay. And then, of course, a lot of women struggle with anorexia and bulimia during pregnancy um, because they're getting fat. Okay. And you have to encourage them to understand they're not getting fat. They're getting bigger, okay? And it's not fat, it's baby. It's the increase in the, in the blood volume, in the placenta, in the uterus, and the amniotic fluid, in the baby. And it, the number that you see on the scale is not a pre-pregnant weight, okay? 30 pounds of this is baby, don't worry about it, okay? And so, encouraging to do that. And when they talk about it, are you sure you're eating okay? I don't want you starving yourself to death because you're worried about seeing 140 on the scale, okay? Um, it's amazing um, to me, as somebody who's been fat his whole life and could care less, it's amazing to me when people freak out about numbers on a scale, but I try to understand that for some people that, you know, the scale means more to other people than it does to me. And so it's important to just under, to give them realistic guidance that this is how much you're going to gain in pregnancy. You can't go against it. The, ba the baby plus the placenta plus the uterus plus the amniotic fluid plus the blood volume is going to weigh a certain amount. You're not just going to gain seven pounds because that's the baby. You gotta gain everything to support the baby. In the military, I always use the analogy of an infantry division. Infantry divisions don't travel by themselves. They have supply and comms and they have Devardi and the aviation and all those other things that go with it, right? You need all this stuff to keep it going. And we talked a little bit about vegetarian diets, food cravings and aversions. What myths and, and, and old wives tales have you guys heard about food cravings? Pickles and ice cream. Pickles and ice creams. I've never had anyone eat it, but that is the most common stereotype, is pickles and ice creams. Um, but there is a sweet, savory component to it an awful lot, where I think that comes from. But have you guys heard that uh, what you eat in pregnancy is because you have a deficiency of that? Mm -hmm. It's not true, but it's, it's, it's a nice theory. But we haven't been able to link that in, uh, to any scientific evidence. Um, and, uh, uh, and women will eat unusual things. Women will have weird auditory uh, needs. Uh, tactile needs, like the need to play with with, with dust or with, with corn starch, yeah. or smell things. They have to smell certain types of detergent or certain types of spices all the time for no reason at all, and we have not been able to figure out why it is, but it happens. It's like going back to the, the sensory and, and smelling, because I know you mm -hmm. the high sense of smell, so does that mean the olfactory nerve is just kind of, okay. Nobody knows. I've never been able to get a good answer for it. Oh, cultural factors. The, old, the real important thing about cultural factors is that some people just have bad habits, okay? Like that sushi nonsense, okay? <laughs> if you're eating raw food, sushi, steak tartare, cat poop, whatever, I don't care whether it's cultural or not cultural, okay? You gotta watch against food poisoning, all right? Um, and when I was in Rhode Island uh, doing my grad school, we had seven women in the same year who died of listeriosis. They were all Hispanic, and they all got it from eating, what's it called, queso blanco? Like, a, it's a soft white cheese. I just had that like today. It's a wonderful cheese. <laughs> but it's known to, to harbor listeria, listeria. And listeria in anyone in this room will just give you the runs for a few days and make you wish you were dead. Listeria in pregnancy will kill you, okay? And so it's important uh, to... to uh, <coughs> to talk about some of the cultural foods that may not be healthy, like raw foods and foods that aren't well processed, okay? And as a general, like you, if, if, yeah, I believe your book talks about not eating uncooked meats, staying away from deli meats and that kind of stuff, about cooking the, cooking the ham and the turkey, you know, before you put it in your sandwiches, and that's a wonderful choice. 
But, for, but most women are like, well, I'm not going to eat that nonsense. That's garbage. If you burn it, why would I want to burn it and then eat it? And I say, well, then pick healthy, um, trustworthy sources, okay? Go, boar's head, Oscar Mayer, very little contamination, okay? Grandma, Grandma Fred's little backyard deli with the flies <laughs> buzzing around, maybe not. Right? The random street vendor with the hot dogs or the taco trucks. I don't know if I trust that as well. Stay away from Tijuana altogether. You know? <laughs> the whole place is food poisoning. Okay? So just assessing for risks when you're talking about that. We talked about exercise. Your book talks about limiting rigorous aerobic activity, and I talked about how it's not really limiting it. It's using common sense. Do what you used to do, understanding you may need to slow down or you may not. Okay? Uh, work. Work is a tough one, okay? Because um, 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 pregnant women are not designed to run the same speed that they did before they got pregnant. And there are going to be complications that come up with working too much. If you're a clerk and you stand up all day long, you're going to have problems if you're pregnant, okay? If your job is to be out there cutting grass and moving mulch, you're not going to be able to do that as well when you're pregnant, working in the hot summer sun or whatever. And so I talk to my, uh, my, my folks about negotiating with their bosses. You know, if you're, a good, if you're a good worker before you get pregnant and you slow down a little bit, most bosses can understand that a little bit. Okay? But if you were a slug before you got pregnant, I promise they're going to beat you to death while you're pregnant because now they're just looking for an excuse to get rid of you. So I say, you know, work hard, do the right thing, make sure they, in the army we have a bad habit of it. We treat all pregnant women like they're made out of glass, and then we complain about them for the whole time that they're pregnant because they're useless. Well, the sergeant made them useless when they put you in the orderly room and make you answer phones all day. What a worthless thing to do. So I say, no, go out and do your job as long as it's not harmful. You know, I don't want you being, you know, a window washer on the, on the 84th floor, and I, I don't want you lugging mulch when it's 120 degrees outside, but I want you to do your job while you're pregnant. And then when you need support at the end, you've saved up what I call your pity points. And then at the end of the pregnancy, when you need to cash in a little pity points, most people will understand that, okay? So understand that work does, or pregnancy does impact on it. And the other one is maternity leave. Maternity leave is limited, okay? And um, if you, I believe it's called, um, oh, it's not FAFSA, it's um, there's a Family Leave Act, right. There's that Emergency Family Leave Act. That Emergency Family Leave Act gives you, what is it, six or 12 weeks? Okay, if you burn that up while you're pregnant, guess what happens when you're, when you've delivered? You don't have any more, okay? So they have to use their leave sparingly. They have to save up their leave before they get pregnant. And they have to be careful what they're doing, okay? An awful lot of women go back to work immediately after delivery, and I feel sorry for them. I really do. Um, it's, a, it's, it's really an unfair burden all the way around. Um, and I can't do anything about it. Okay. Interestingly enough, there isn't any evidence that it helps to not go back to work. Okay. England um, has the exact same breastfeeding rate that we do, even though they have visiting home health nurses that come visit them from the third trimester of pregnancy and the first six months postpartum. They have the same breastfeeding rates we do. They have the same postpartum depression rates we do. They have the same postpartum complication rates that we do. Okay. So there isn't a lot of evidence. It would be nice to give everyone six months or a year or two years off after having a baby. It's just not the way the capitalist system, the capitalist system works, and so it's a it's a tough uh, it's a tough um, um, push and pull that people have to have to work out on their own. What is it worth to you? Okay, um, uh, 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 and it's not really fair for anyone to have any preconceived notions of what's going to happen next. I generally say, when it comes down to it, you got to say what's more important to me. Okay. You pick what's important and you go for what's important. Whatever what's important is, is fine with me, okay? If what's important is staying home, fine, stay home. If what's important is continue to function in your professional role, by all means do it. I mean, all my friends are midwives. They all deliver and go right back to work just as soon as possible afterward, and they bring their babies with them most of the time. Fine, that's not what I would choose, but I'm okay with that, okay? And they just have to work it out amongst themselves. Soldiers, they have a raw deal. The Army doesn't like mothers, period. And so I tell all my soldiers, get out. It's like poltergeist. Get out. The army will kick you out as soon as you want them to if you're pregnant. 
As soon as the pea hits the stick, you can file for a Chapter 8 and get out of the Army. Because they, they know that being a mother is hard in the Army. And so I tell them, get out. The, your baby needs you more than the Army needs another private. Yes? I was just curious. Have there been any studies done to see the effect that a partner that takes leave with the mother? You like, mean like paternity leave yeah. kind of thing? Well, not, not specifically to paternity leave. There's an awful lot of studies out there talking about how supportive, helpful fathers who spend as much time at home uh, really enhance everything. Okay? Mm -hmm. What women need is help. It takes two people to make a baby. It takes two people to take care of a baby, right? You know, and uh, so there's an awful lot of good evidence out there that says that the more time partner spends at home, the better everything is. Um, but it's not really specific to paternity leave. Because uh, paternity leave is, is a very rare thing. In the Army, they tried to do two weeks of paternity leave. It never really worked. Um, and then there are a couple of countries where they, there's six months and they can split it as two, three months, you know, some mom, some dad. But I haven't read anything like in, out of uh, Sweden that shows that, that that improves much. Okay? There are just too many variables. Okay? Medications, we talked about these already. There really are no safe medications, right? Most of the medications are class C, which is they've either harmed, bait, harmed animals but no evidence of harming humans, or that they haven't harmed humans, or they haven't har harmed animals, and we haven't really tested to see if they harm humans, okay? So, uh, you know, and every year we learn about another medication that we thought was safe that isn't. These days, they all start with Z. This year it was Zofran. The year before that it was Zoloft. But um, every time we find something new. And the key to medicines is to use as little medication as humanly possible. Common discomforts, you know what, we need a break, it's four o'clock. Take a break. Take a long break, like 15 minutes, and then talk straight until 4.30. Oh, it's already 4 o'clock? Yeah. Oh, my goodness. In only a few minutes, then we'll get back to it. <laughs> I was thinking I had another hour. Yeah, we were looking at you like, oh, I know, right? I'll take 15. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fine with me. I don't have to take the test. seen a lot of people nodding, dying. <laughs> My brain is full. I can't take any more. I had a test this morning and then your test and so we're kind of just like that. I understand. We're kind of checked out. At least I am. I'm okay with it. Yeah. So I put out on Blackboard um, that I, 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 I updated the schedule to reflect kind of where we were. And I purposely built in a little time right around um, high risk pregnancy and postpartum so that I could have time to just catch up. Uh, during that. You didn't so, move the what's that? Did you move? The no. Second? No. Okay. It's the day after the major. Is it really? Oh my. I gotta write my priorities around that time. <laughs> <laughs> I got my ticket. That's sad. I know. Time Nick Jones Use Nick Jones as your study break. I know. Like, it's only a couple hours. Breaks. I don't even know what happened. It doesn't have to be a whole weekend affair. I say it's amended. It's probably like a six days. Yeah, I don't know. I had to work some drug deals. I had to get extra tickets. <laughs> my daughter and her friend, my next door neighbor, oddly enough. She's 40 years old, so and she wants to go see Nick Jonas. <laughs> she said, well, so you need a ticket? No, no, I got, I got uh, plenty. You say, I'll give you some grades for this ticket. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I don't know. You, 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 it would take a lot of convincing to get me to go see a Nick Jonas concert. You think so? I think so. Now, Justin Timberlake, that I would go see. Yeah. Nick Jonas, Nick. Yeah. I've only 
been to one concert in my whole life. What concert? Billy Joel. Yeah, in the 80s. Did you have a concert bucket list? You did? You don't? I'm not two people on my, like, my two Oh, yeah? Yeah. This is past year. Meaning you went to them or you decided it wasn't yeah. worth it? My brother and I, like, growing up, worked with Snapchat. 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 I don't go to concerts for the same reason I don't own a gun. You know, it'd be nice to go, but every time I try to, I look at it, I go, was it really worth it to spend 200 bucks? No. It's not worth it. They want to do it because Patsy wants to go on Thursday, so they don't want people. By the way, your computer was singing to us. Was it? I'm so sorry. It was just randomly playing music. Really? Yeah, for like. Five seconds and then we'll stop. Was good selection of I don't know what it was. Just, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No. I was like, what is making that noise? I might have gotten the Wednesday. I had it on Thursday. All right, let's see what we got. I thought, 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 I
Dyspepsia, that's a fancy word for heartburn. Um, again, we talked about how progesterone causes that, but also everything pushing up on the stomach will make that happen. Uh, flatulence, yeah, gassy. Con constipation, hemorrhoids, dental problems. All of those are blood volume problems, okay? Um, dental problems, I think, are worth mentioning because dental infections cause preterm birth. And so we want pregnant women to get a dental cleaning at the beginning of the pregnancy or just before they get pregnant, and again, about midway through their pregnancy. Um, because uh, dental gingivitis and such can cause, um, can cause preterm birth just because it's an infection in the body. Urinary tract infections can cause contractions, but dental infections cause birth. It's a pretty interesting thing. So good dental care when they're pregnant. Dependent edema, varicose veins, diff, uh, painful, your, uh, painful intercourse. Uh, the painful intercourse can be caused by the, 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 uh, the increased vascularity. Um, but also just because there's something in the pelvis that gets in the way and dad bumps into it from time to time. And, you know, I tell him if it hurts, change positions. Yeah. If you do change positions again, if it hurts again. The most common positions that, that don't cause pain are where uh, mom, and, mom is kind of sidelined and they kind of go at it like scissors um, or uh, doggy style because everything goes down and out of the way and allows, you know, intercourse. Insomnia, which we talked about, how insomnia is not a bad thing. It's an adaptation to motherhood. Uh, and if you look at it as a bad thing, it's going to torture you. But if you realize, I can't sleep at night because I'm pregnant, okay, sleep during the day. Bless you. And then round ligament pain, the most common pain that women get. Okay, I think we beat that up pretty well last time. Hyperventilation and shortness of breath, we talked about that. Numbness and, the tingling, numbness and tingling in the fingers caused by A, breathing more often than normal, so you get a little hypercapnia, but also that pressure uh, 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 in your armpits and in your elbows will cause numbness and tingling on your fingertips uh, while you're pregnant. And then supine hypotension syndrome. We talk about this over and over and over again. Please, when you're in Womack or in Cape Fear and you see a laboring woman strapped to the bed and flat on her back, ask the nurses why how she doesn't get supine hypotension syndrome. And he'll always go, well, we're not supposed to, but we're morons and we do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Warning signs in pregnancy. Severe, persistent vomiting. Almost all women vomit when they're pregnant. More so in the first trimester than later on, but it can happen to anybody. Um, they call it morning sickness, but it's not. It's all day sickness. Um, but it tends to be more powerful in the morning. Um, 75% of women will have some nausea and vomiting in the first trimester of pregnancy. A lucky 20% of women will continue to have persistent nausea and vomiting in the second trimester. And a lucky 5% have nausea and vomiting right up until the day their baby is born. Okay? It's, uh, it's, uh, um, it, it's, it, there is a link to nausea and vomiting and anxiety and type A personalities. And there's also a link to the increased thyroid function causing a, a nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. We haven't been able to fix it. All we can do is try to make it better when we can. But when we talk about severe and persistent, we mean all day, every day. She hit, she's gone more than 24 hours, and she hasn't been able to tolerate even a sip of water. Uh, we talk about uh, women who lose more than 10% of their body weight uh, in the first trimester of pregnancy. Uh, they start to get electrolyte dysfunction, and they start they need you know fluid replacement. And I've even had a woman um, go, where we put a Dobhoff tube in. You guys, you guys hear about a Dobhoff tube? Pretty darn rare. A Dobhoff tube is an NG tube, but it's got a little lead weight on it. And so they pass it through into the stomach, and then they roll mom over on the side, and it passes into the intestine. So your, your NG, your tube feeding, bypasses the stomach entirely and goes into the small intestine directly. And if there's nothing in the stomach, there's no vomiting. And so um, they, they, they're fed through a tube, but they can't have, but they have nothing in their stomach at all. Pretty impressive. It's easier than a TPN. Uh, than parenteral nutrition, but um, it's pretty bad. Abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding, especially in the first trimester, are a sign of what? Yes. Abortion. Abortion, miscarriage, right? Um, about half of all bleeding in the first trimester of pregnancy is a miscarriage. The other half is subchorionic hemorrhage or cervical problems or that kind of thing. Um, but uh, it's important to know that while bleeding is a bad thing, we never want to see it. Only half of the time does it mean it's a pregnancy loss. The other half of the time, it's something that we can work with in pregnancy. And then, of course, indications of infection. Fever, pain, uh, that kind of thing. 
dysuria, frequency in urea, um, all of those things. We want to we want to know about those in pregnancy. Second trimester, um, the 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 big ones are here: premature rupture of membranes, preterm labor, and preeclampsia. Um, premature rupture of membranes it happens um, very very rarely. I've seen it maybe five or six times. The water breaks at like 19 or 20 weeks. It almost always is fatal to the baby. Um, and as long, but as long as they don't get an infection with this decrease uh, with this water breaking, we can kind of watch them until they either go into labor spontaneously. Uh, uh, usually, it's within the next week. But I have had one one instance in the last 15 years where mom's water broke at 19 weeks and the baby survived. But it's very very rare. Okay, uh, preterm labor. Um, about 10 to 12 percent of women will deliver uh, prematurely sometime before 37 weeks. The vast majority is after 34 weeks and it's okay, but the earlier the preterm labor, the more dangerous it is to baby, okay? Um, 24, 26 weeks is pretty, pretty tough ride. 30 weeks is better, 36 weeks is even better than that, but we want to stay pregnant as long as we can. And then preeclampsia. If you get preeclampsia in the second trimester, you are in deep, deep doo-doo, okay? Because preeclampsia is a progressively worsening disorder. And the longer you have it, the worse it gets, the more dangerous it gets. When we get preeclampsia at 24, 25 weeks, mom and baby can die, okay? It's very serious. Um, if it comes in 37, 38 weeks, no big deal, we just deliver, we're done. Okay, yes ma'am. Mm, that's rough. It's rough because I mean, and, and that that baby's in trouble. Okay, uh, and mom will be okay once they get the placenta out, but uh, but baby baby gets into real trouble there. So second trimester preeclampsia is an extremely dangerous thing, and hypertension and postpartum hemorrhage are the number one and two reason why women die in America. Um, both of them are pregnancy complications, and then fetal complications. The most common being a decreased bundle height, which indicates a decreased growth. It's called intrauterine growth retardation or restriction, depending on which source you read. Um, and so every time we, we see a pregnant woman, we measure from the tip of the pubic bone to the top of the fundus, mm -hmm. and we want, and it should be within two centimeters of how, how many weeks she is pregnant. Okay, it's very, very predictable. And if it drops below, uh, more than two centimeters off, then we have to ask ourselves why. Is it because baby's not growing well? Is it because Baby happens to be rolled up into a tight little ball today and he's not measuring it all as he normally would. Is it because mom doesn't have enough amniotic fluid? Is it something, is it baby is dropped down in the pelvis and she's going into labor? Why are we not measuring the appropriately, right? So all by itself, fundal height doesn't tell us anything. It's just, the, it's just a failed screening test. And I tell parents, it's kind of like having high blood pressure. If you have high blood pressure, it doesn't mean you need heart surgery. It just means you have a failed screening test and we need to look deeper to find out what's wrong, right? That's all it is, it's just a signal. And an absence of fetal movement after quickening. Now, that is not decreased fetal movement. That's absence of fetal movement. And what that means is, baby normally moves wonderfully, but I haven't felt it move in two or three days, okay? There is no such thing as a baby who doesn't move for two or three days, okay? You can't get a toddler to sit still no matter how hard you try. Preschoolers are always on the move and babies are always moving. In the second trimester, it can be a little confusing, okay, because we don't, it, it, their kicks aren't strong and constant and it's easy to get distracted. And so we don't worry about fetal movement counts until about 28 weeks. But once they start feeling movement, they should be able to reliably feel movement at least a couple times a day, you know, for the rest of their pregnancy. Now, in the third trimester, we call it decreased fetal movement if it's less than 10 kicks in two hours uh, when mom is paying attention. So we can, we can quantify it much better in the third trimester. But in absence of fetal movement, a woman comes and says, I haven't felt my baby move in a day or two, no matter what I've tried. You have to make the assumption that baby is, at the very least, unwell, okay? And you have to, you have to track that down. Those are, uh, that is an emergency until proven otherwise. It has to be your number one priority. Third trimester, lots of fun problems. Gestational diabetes, which occurs right about 28 weeks and gets progressively worse through pregnancy. Uh, very common, happens in about 10 to 15% of pregnant women. Um, we screen for it with a one hour glucola at 28 weeks. Well, we have them drink a 75 uh, gram sugar load 
and then an hour later draw their blood to see whether their body can handle that 75 gram load. If they can, I'm sorry, yeah, 75 grams. Is it 75 grams? All of a sudden I got myself doubting, thinking it's a 50 gram load. Whatever. We give them a sugar load, and then an hour later we test their blood. If they don't pass that, then we go to a three hour glucola, where we draw a fasting blood sugar, and then a, a, a much bigger load, and then one hour, two hours, and three hours postpartum we draw, or postprandial we draw it again, and see what we get. Okay? If the body can't handle blood sugar, and their glucose level rises, despite the fact that they don't have anything else by mouth, then they have gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is a, uh, the body's inability to tolerate the insulin resistance of pregnancy. Lucky for us, 95% of the time, all we have to do is eat right and exercise and it'll take care of problems, okay? It's not a big deal. But they, we, took, we teach them carbo count, carb counting just like every other diabetic, and we talk about the value of having a nice, you know, rhythmic schedule about eating on time and about taking their blood sugars. We request them to take their blood sugar four times a day, fasting and two hours postprandial, three meals a day, okay? And uh, as long as they can keep their blood sugars pretty well controlled, all we need to do is diet and exercise. A lucky 5% will require medications. The most common we use today is metformin. It's pretty nice, you take a little half a pill at night before you go to bed, and it's all better. But if that doesn't work, then we go to insulin. We don't want pregnant women giving themselves insulin. That's a big problem. Uh, it causes all kinds of growth problems for baby, it causes all kinds of problems for mommy. But if we have excessively high blood sugars, it can hurt the baby pretty badly. So we try to keep very tight control. Now, does your book mention specifics? I'm sure it does. As a general rule, we want our fasting blood sugars less than 95 and our two-hour presprandials um, less than 120. Now, has anybody learned about diabetes in your adult health class? Have you guys already learned about it? Mm -hmm. Is that what we, does that sound like what we use for adult diabetics? What are the standards for adult diabetics usually? Yeah, what's a, fast, a normal fasting and a normal uh, postprandial value in, a, in an adult diabetic? 110 to 120 is what I usually hear for a fasting. Way higher than pregnant women, okay? And the postprandials, they usually say, ah, as long as it's under 200, you're fine. Can you think about why is there such a drastic difference? Why we're so strict in pregnancy, but we're not when you're not pregnant? Because of the baby. Okay, because how does diabetes kill adults? Slowly over 50 years, right? But babies don't have 50 years, okay? <clears throat> babies are gr gr growing dramatically and changing every day, and so their pregnancy, of, uh, diabetes affects them dramatically from day to day. So every elevated blood sugar causes problems for babies. Um, the biggest problem that they get is that they, you know, just like grown-ups with diabetes, they pee a lot. Okay, they drink a lot and they pee a lot, so mom gets polyhydramnios and all this excess fluid which can lead to preterm birth and you know, all kinds of wonderful complications like that. And then the other big problem is a baby doesn't have insulin resistance. Baby doesn't have diabetes. Baby's perfectly normal, okay? And he can handle the excess sugar load from mom pretty well, but as soon as he's born, you know, so he's compensating. As soon as he's born, there's no excess sugar load anymore. And babies, newborns have a, a drastic drop in their blood sugar immediately after being born if mom had diabetes. And so we have to watch a newborn's blood sugar real closely when mom has diabetes. And the better she was able to control it during her pregnancy, the less strain it's going to be on the newborn. Okay? And then uh, uh, placenta previa and abruptio placenta. Now, I know it's the last thing we're going to talk about in this class, and you guys are all dying, but I <laughs> beg you, pay attention to this. You're going to see this over and over again. We love to ask it in clinicals. We love to see it on tests. We love to see it in the end class. There's placenta previa is marked by painless vaginal bleeding. Abruptio placenta or placental abruption is marked with painful vaginal bleeding. Can anyone tell me why? Abruptio placenta would be painful and placenta preview would be not painful. Give me why abruptio placenta is painful. Because it's detaching from okay. the, like, the, the detaching from the Exactly. The placenta is being ripped from the uterine wall and it causes incredible contraction power um, and an awful lot of bleeding. Uh, I've seen a, a, abruptio placenta deliver in like 15 minutes. They're just like from zero to bang, 
very, very quick. Because mom and baby are going to bleed to death very quickly. Usually what happens is they get this incredible pain, they're bleeding, and they're dying. It's, they've just had a car accident or something like that. And they're yelling and screaming and they're just dying with the most pain you can ever imagine. And we come, we're like, oh my God. And we, take, we listen to baby, his heart rate's in the 50s. We run back for an emergency C-section and her uterus is full of blood. And hopefully we can save mom and baby. Uh, but yeah, so abrupt placenta is abrupt, it's traumatic, it's oh my God. When you see it, you will never forget it, okay? And any woman who's having painful contractions and bleeding has abruptio placenta until proven otherwise. Okay? Now, tell me about placenta previa. Oh, you had your hand up? Oh. <laughs> okay. So tell me about placenta previa. Oh, oh no, wait a minute. Is it when it gets like lodged in the bottom of the... Uterus. Mm -hmm. It's actually when the placenta covers the cervix. Okay, and so if the placenta is covering the cervix, um, does that is that sound like a bad idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you had to deliver through your lungs, you might get in trouble, right? And so what happens is the baby has to go through the placenta in order to be born, and the placenta can't function that way, right? And so the reason they get painless bleeding is because the cervix changes all the time, all right? But it's got this vascular bed built onto it. So as the cervix changes, it tears the placenta just a little bit and it causes some bleeding. And that bleeding can be significant. It can be, you know, several peripads in an hour bleeding. Um, but mom doesn't feel it, okay? Mom doesn't notice it because the cervix, there's no, there's no pain receptors in the placenta. And so as the placenta is being disrupted at the cervix, nothing is happening, or she's not noticing it, she's not excessively contracting, she just has bleeding. And we go and we look like, oh, hey, look, there's a placenta in the way. That's not good, okay? Of the two, placenta previa causes more problems than placental abruption. Placental abruption is, is trauma, okay? It's usually caused by a car accident or falling down stairs or, you know, that kind of thing. Or crack cocaine is a big one for placental abruption. I say that a lot, crack cocaine, like it's a joke, <laughs> but it really is. Crack cocaine is incredibly bad for pregnant people, okay? But, um, but it, it tends to cause placental abruption. In the, in the woman without any significant history, the most common cause of placental abruption is high blood pressure. High blood pressure will knock that placenta off the wall really fast and then mom and baby bleed to death very quickly. As a matter of fact, our last mom and baby who died at Womack was high blood pressure, who killed her. She, her BMI was like 45, and she got severe hypertension, and she came in having an abruption at, at like 23, 25 weeks, and baby died almost immediately, and mom died two weeks later of a blood clot. Um, but it was, it was hypertension that, that did the man, okay? And then fetal complications is hypoxia. It is usually caused at, in, uh, um, by some kind of a strain on uh, the umbilical cord or uh, a malfunctioning placenta. It's called placental, a fetal, uh, placental insufficiency. So the placenta won't function properly and you can't give baby blushes. Can't give baby enough oxygen. And when that happens, the baby will have heart rate decelerations and all kinds of fun stuff, which we will talk about as a labor complication later on. Okay, so those are the major third trimester complications, and I think we can go. Oh, we'll have to stop because it's four o'clock, four thirty. Unless you want to go till five. <laughs> <laughs>